As the historic Golden Rule Peace Ship makes its way up the East Coast, we've taken the time to document some of the many military toxic waste sites left over from a century of American imperialism. Today, we're going to feature a conversation between our old friend, investigative journalist Pat Elder from Military Poisons and Dean Nauyuk from the Potomac River Keeper Network, who is in the process of suing the military under the Clean Water Act. Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, the Potomac River Keeper and the River Keepers Association in general and, and the work that um, you all do in the Potomac? So uh, my name is Dean Nyx. I'm the Potomac River Keeper. I work for Potomac River Keeper Network. And uh, my organization is a nonprofit organization. We do a lot of Clean Water Act enforcement. Uh, we have an Upper Potomac River Keeper and a Shenandoah River Keeper as well. And we all work on a variety of issues, but basically our focus is eliminating sources of pollution uh, to the Potomac and Shenandoah River. And we've been around for about 25 years and uh, we use the Clean Water Act. There's citizen tools in the Clean Water Act that allow groups like ours, uh, when the agencies are not enforcing the Clean Water Act, um, or there's an ongoing source of pollution that gives us the opportunity to intervene, um, hold a polluter accountable, take them to federal court if necessary, and actually uh, force cleanup action or uh, abate the source of pollution. And we're doing this currently, and we've done it a, a lot throughout the 25 years my organization has been around. So we, we, you know, our organization, we have an upper Potomac River keeper, his name Brent Walls. Yeah, Brent. He did some great work on the on the PFAS testing near wastewater treatment plants and, you know, work with U.S., you know, the geological survey people. I, I saw his work. Yeah. Great. yeah. So I, I'm like the coal ash expert, and I've been working with coal ash fighting Dominion and on and NRG and so it was kind of a divide and conquer thing, but now that I live on Piscataway Creek, it's like I really need to learn a lot more, uh, you know, about Andrews Air Force Base and PFAS. And then we're also suing the Dahlgren facility uh, right now, or get it, we filed notice of intent to sue. Um, so I'm really interested in learning more about the uh, Indian Head Naval Warfare Center. I haven't dug into that issue. You know, I mean, right. a lot of these issues we work on takes years before nah, we reach nah. settlement or clean up or uh, you know to a degree i mean things are fantastically complex but when you try to do too much it's too much <laughs> yeah yeah for sure for sure but yeah dahlgren uh and 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 indian head i, I can i can um you know give you some sites to, to use to, to make um pro publica has this site called Bombs in your backyard. Have, have you ever seen that before? Bombs wow. in your backyard. And you can um, click on um, Dahlgren or, you know, Indian Head and, and see the um, contaminants in surface water, you know, groundwater. Um, it's four years old, but still most of it hasn't been cleaned up. Yeah, I mean, so there's there's legacy stuff, but, uh, you know, as you probably know, under the Clean Water Act, has to be an ongoing source of pollution. So we're yeah. seeing, we've filed notice of intent to sue the Navy um, for their ongoing discharges from their um, guns, you know, from the Dogren site. Because they've been discharging munitions without a permit, without a Clean Water Act permit for, you know, uh, since the Clean Water Act has been enacted. So I suspect it's a different situation. That, um, you know, Indian heads, I'd like to learn a little bit more so you mentioned ongoing sources. So if there are violations of the Clean Water Act that are legacy violations, I guess you would call them, then you're not as concerned with that? We, we are currently in settlement discussions with the city of Alexandria over uh, you know, discharges of Napoline and coal tar from their old gas work site. They've been discharging into the Potomac River for over 50 years without a permit. Um, we've been trying to talk to them about fixing that for many years. They, we finally didn't feel that they were going to resolve the issue. We then moved toward litigation. Uh, they then hired a law firm and said, okay, we're going to meet, we're going to reach a settlement agreement. And it's a, it's a pretty positive outcome. Um, but again, it is Alexandria, very progressive city. 
Um, they have EcoCity in their charter. Other cases are not so cut and dry, not so easy. Um, right now, we're suing the Navy uh, or filed notice of intent to sue the Navy at their Dahlgren site downriver below the 301 bridge for uh, the past 90 years. They've been discharging munitions into the river, uh, as well as biological and chemical weapon simulants into the river without a Clean Water Act permit. And, uh, you know, and obviously it's been there for 90 years, but ever since the Clean Water Act came around in 1972, uh, they've continued to discharge without permit places like Puerto Rico, which previously was the largest open water weapons testing range in the country, was required over 20 years ago to get a Clean Water Act permit in the state of Puerto Rico. And yet here we are in Virginia, just literally 60, 70 miles from the nation's capital. And, you know, we have the largest open water uh, weapons testing range. And they've discharged over 33 million uh, pounds of ordinances into the river without a permit. There are also threats to the endangered uh, Atlantic sturgeon. Um, and while like the 301 bridge, when they just recently, um, you know, finished the 301 bridge crossing, the Harry Nice Bridge, they were stopped at critical times, uh, January through June, protect the endangered Atlantic sturgeon and the spawning habitat. Meanwhile, Dahlgren continues to bomb away repeatedly every single day other than the weekends. And so we also filed an Endangered Species Act to protect the endangered Atlantic sturgeon. We don't know if we're gonna reach a settlement or go to court, um, but we feel very strongly. We have a strong case against the Navy and we are going to require them to get a Clean Water Act permit. And in one area in particular, they've discharged over 69,000 large projectile munitions into the river in this area called the Dent Zone, which is uh, right near Colonial Beach and Cobb Island. Yeah. Um, 69,000 rounds per nautical square mile into that area of the river. And their assumptions are that there's no impact to the river. All stuff gets into the sediments and breaks down and there's no environmental impacts and it's all been based on modeling so can you give me that uh you know um statistic again 59,000 individual 69,000 rounds of ordnance per nautical square mile where the river is about five miles wide there so 69,000 rounds okay yeah missiles literally missiles that right of that, and and their data says that they their their modeling says that only zero point one percent are unearthed from storm events and weather events. But the reality is, is we have pictures of watermen pulling up these projectiles. Some of them over fifty years after oh, the yeah. river. Yeah, yeah, I'm a buddy that lives on Saint Inigo's Creek where I live. George Fish has um, is an oysterman. He's been up there and he's dredged bits of bombs. You know, um, so if you have pictures. We'd love to see that. I, you know, I can't even get him on the record. You know, yeah, no worries. No I would have written his name, and I, I would have, uh, you know, I tried um, to make it a uh, a campaign issue. I ran against Hoyer for what it's worth in 2018, and um, you know, I mean, you know, and I I mentioned, of course, the Dogrens, um Middle Testing Zone. What did you call it? Dead Zone. It's called the Dense Zone. Dead. It's 11,000 to 13,000 uh, yards downstream from the Dogren plant, right it's below the point above Cobb Island. Right. And you're calling that DEAD dead zone, right? No, dense. Okay. I, I, that's why I was asking you. Okay. And that's what the Navy zone. calls it, not us. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so 13,000 yards divided by how many... Uh, <laughs> How many yards in a mile? We're talking about something that might be around um, how many miles? Twenty miles? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. I'm not a math person. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got my calculator <laughs> here. <laughs> I just know the river's five miles wide there, and if it's sixty-nine thousand rounds per nautical square mile, that there's a lot of munitions there that have been discharged to the river and are likely just sitting right on the bottom, um, and a lot of them are unexploded ordinances. So literally. Um, it, it's it, it, my lawyers are concerned about us grabbing sediment samples over the fear of an explosive device um, going off when we're right. sampling. That's right. Right. That's well, true. can you um, uh, send me um, 
most uh, of what you have on Dahlgren, and I've written about Dahlgren a couple times now, uh, but nothing uh, with these statistics in it. And, um, you know, how much uh, uh, of this uh, preliminary, you know, stage of the um, complaint are you willing to make public? I mean, can I write about what you got? Uh, absolutely. So we have their 2013 environmental impact statement that has, you know, a lot of good information, but again, is based on modeling assumptions. Yep. We have our notice uh, on the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act, which is our notice of intent to sue. That's public information. So I'd be happy to share that information. Yeah, please send it to me. Um, I mean, I have um, probably uh, a thousand people um, that are uh, in Maryland and Virginia together. Uh, most of them, or not most of them, but a lot of regulators and legislators and, uh, you know, members of, of you know, state agencies and activists. So, I mean, I, I'm in a position to, to um, you know, get people to, you know, create a buzz about this. And I saw the press that you got, uh, I guess it was about two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, yeah, we haven't even done prep, but um, the, the um, Chesapeake Bay, Bay Journal's uh, Tim has, Wheeler. Yeah, he's he's been really interested in this. So yeah, yeah, man, I tried to get done any press conferences or anything yet. Yeah, yeah, um, I tried to get um, Tim to cover, you know, the Golden Rule, and um, because he covered, you know, Brent and he covered me down here, you know, on the PFAS and. Uh, but um, he didn't touch the golden rule, so I was a little bit disappointed with that. I even invited him to one of the parties that we had, you know, in Chesapeake Beach. But that's a that's a busy guy, you know. And yeah. uh, I mean, he's it. Who else is writing about it? Any any help at all? Um, any kind of coverage from the Washington Post? You know, to me, like I said, we haven't reached out because we actually haven't filed. We filed notice of intent to sue, but we haven't. Yeah. The, the good thing is the Navy said that they were going to do a consult with uh, National Marine Fisheries for the endangered species claim. So that's kind of off the table now, which is good. Yeah. They're legally required to do that. They just refused to do it until we filed notice of intent. Um, right. Clean Water Act claim they asked for an additional 60 days to come back. We just met with them last week. And so basically uh, come May, I think, 31st, they have to have a response to us whether they believe our Clean Water Act notice of intent to sue claim is is valid in their minds, right? And they're gonna work with us on a settlement, or we're going to go to court. You know, we're going to move forward with litigation, like we did with Alexandria recently. Well, it sounds to me May thirty first may be a news hook, regardless of the way. Yeah, they respond. and that's when we'll do more press and uh, on this issue. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I would love to be. You know. Uh, close to the forefront of that. I um, got a friend, um, Sam Hussein, he was with the Institute for Public Accuracy. And, you know, I don't know where this is going to, to stand, but um, you're probably not going to get NPR in the Washington Post, right? I mean, I don't know. Do you have any sense? Uh, I mean, I feel like if we move forward with a Clean Water Act case, it's going to get a lot of attention. I mean, this is the Navy. Um, a lot of people, even like, you know, Senator Van Hollen and others that we've talked to, they didn't even know that there was this large open water, bot, the largest open water Van, test in the nation. Van Hollen, well. You know, um, so uh, I think it's a surprise to a lot of people. And it's just one of those things like, I think, kind of captures media's interest when they start understanding what this is about. I mean, the fact that we're rele they're releasing biological, chemical uh, simulants into the river um, is really concerning. And the list on their EIS of over 50 chemicals and heavy metals um, in their own environmental impact statement about what all this stuff is, is pretty concerning. Uh, you look at that list. I want to see it. You got, you know, I'll yeah. hit you up. Hey, what's your email address before I forget, you know? So, uh, and please send me yours too, but dean yeah, at sure. riverkeeper.org. Say it again. I'm sorry. Dean at Potomac River Keeper. Dot org. Did you see the work that was done um, in a collaborative effort um, between CycloPure um, testing firm and uh, the National Riverkeepers Association? 
No, you mean Waterkeeper Alliance? Uh, yeah, I have... Waterkeeper Alliance. That's what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I linked up, uh, you know, um, a couple of the Waterkeepers, uh, Fred Tupman and um, others in That's the great. Midwest, with Cyclopeers leaders, uh, Frank Casso and uh, Katie Casso, and you know, to try to get uh, these little seventy nine dollar PFAS test kits in the hands of of Waterkeepers. And, oh, oh, yeah, no, that yeah, there was like 132, you know, tests that were done or yeah, yeah, locations. You didn't participate in that though, did you? The Potomac well, River my team. my so like I said, the way we've been doing is we we have just limited staff. So, uh, the Potomac River Keeper, which I am, we've been focused on coal ash and plastic pollution. Yeah, and Brent Walls and my. Our legal director at the time, uh, Philip Masigas, been focused on PFAS. Yeah. And when that opportunity came along, my legal director, who'd been working on PFAS, said, "Don't worry, I'll go take care of that." I didn't realize he was going to leave. You know, I thought. Right, right. So he's now the San Diego Coast Keeper, and so I'm not as familiar where he went and grabbed that sample. So now it my, it's my time to start getting more up to speed on PFAS, yeah. Attaway uh, Creek, particularly where I live now. Uh, so well, I'll get, hey, you know, this is, this is the, you know, this, this has the makings of a beautiful relationship. It's like, you know, from uh, Casablanca, <laughs> I'll send you the email, <laughs> we can go back and forth and, uh, but I, yeah, I have a friend, uh, Susan Wind, I don't know if you know that name at all. Mm -hmm. She's from, initially from Mooresville, uh, North Carolina, and now lives down in St. Augustine, Florida, and she was the principal organizer at, uh, of a demonstration that took place in Washington in September uh, against the EPA, and her whole issue is coal ash. Um, and I've been working uh, on it for nine years. I was so I was a river keeper in North Carolina. Um, I was the one of the first responders on the scene for the Dan River spill. But I sued <laughs> you were okay over coal ash in North Carolina and forced them to clean up and recycle, remediate, you know, five million tons of ash at the Bucks. <laughs> And we were the first people to test drinking well contamination and prove that coal ash was leaking in drinking wells in 2015. So I've been working on coal ash for almost 10 years now. Right. Uh, and in fact, fact, I want to talk about that if we can. A little oh, bit. yeah, absolutely. We'll wind you up. Um, but Susan, you know, was, at this point, she would say, cool ass. No, no, not cool ass. Coal ash. <laughs> but you know, there, it's it's it says a lot about you what what you just said about North Carolina eight years ago because that's the epicenter if there ever was Duke and hundred million tons Duke, is that right? I mean, uh, yeah. So what you're saying in the Potomac is minuscule in relation, right? Not minuscule, well, but the legislation we got passed for Dominion Power in 2018 required them to clean up 28 million tons at four sites in Virginia, uh -huh. but that include all the sites like that Appalachian power. Yeah. 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 So I don't know the grand total, but you know, obviously Duke energy has significantly more in North Carolina, but there's other States like Indiana that has 85 coal ash ponds. And right. so there's a lot more in other States, but unfortunately there's not uh warrior advocates are out there fighting. Right. Um, in the Midwest, the way uh, we have here in North Carolina and Virginia and other states. Yeah, yeah. Interesting tidbit about um, Indiana is that um, Mike Pence has close ties with, um, you know, Heritage and Trade Eve, which are two um, disposers of solid uh, of waste and incinerate, you know, PFAS and and other chemicals as well. And it's pretty soft, you know, regulation in that state. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, let's, um, let's have you talk a little bit, if you would, on, um, what is, what is your greatest hope as far as, um, you know, the litigation is concerned, you know, if, if you get past the, you know, initial notice of, of intent to sue and you actually are able to sue, what is it you'd like to see a jury, um, decide and what kinds of activities, actions would you demand of, the Navy in terms of, you know, remediation. Can you address that like in any kind of specific? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're still learning about the issue, you know, and what type of potential harm it's caused the river. We really don't have a good assessment of that. 
Um, so first and foremost, we want them to get a Clean Water Act permit. This is not unreasonable. Under the Clean Water Act, munitions, uh, you know, chemicals, um, you know, weapons of you know that sort of thing are required to have a Clean Water Act permit. And so Dogren has been discharging over 33 million pounds of ordinances into the river and munitions for you know over 90 years, and you know certainly 50 years under Clean Water Act rules. And so we just at first we just want them to get a permit. So we start having a handle on. You know, because the permit's going to require various limits. They're going to look at impact. And then I think, you know, as time goes on, we can then get a better handle on, well, are those limits adequate? What type of impact is this having to the river? But we're still at kind of yeah. step one right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about the the jurisdictional rivalry between Maryland and Virginia? I mean, I'm always intrigued by the state of Maryland own the ownership of the Potomac River, you know, brokered in the colonial period, and how you can be in Colonial Beach, go all the way to the end of the pier, and go to, you know, buy a Maryland lottery ticket because you're in Maryland again, you know, when you park your car in the parking lot in Virginia. Um, and so, you know, you you need to negotiate two jurisdictions here, right? I mean, Maryland has the ownership of the river, Virginia has is the is the location of Dahlgren? How does that all play out in the suit? Well, so <laughs> to get it even more complicated, yeah, I know. Dahlgren facilities in Virginia, uh, Maryland. Most of the waters in the Potomac are Maryland waters, other than the embayments uh, on the Virginia side, and so uh, Maryland holds jurisdiction over the river. Um, what really prompted us to jump on this issue sooner rather than later was Dogren wants to expand its weapons testing range. Right. And, um, the comment period ended on January 4th, so we luckily caught it and submitted comments and then really pushed hard to reopen uh, the comment period because we, we felt that it was not a good idea to have the comment period basically over Thanksgiving and Christmas and everybody kind of being on break not really having the opportunity to see that, but the Army Corps of Engineers is taking those comments. They ended April 7th. Uh, so you have the Corps looking at the expansion. Then there's a Superfund site. Dogren is a Superfund site, which is listed on the national priorities list. Sure. And so you have CERCLA, and then you have MDE overseeing the Maryland portion. And there's just all these different agencies, and they haven't really done, in my opinion, a good job of communicating with each other. So that's one of the things that we're pushing on right now is, you know, making sure that the Superfund people for Virginia DEQ are communicating with the Navy about our concerns about the expanded range, about potential contamination from the site, a Superfund site, into the riverbed. And the fact that the riverbed was never listed as part of the uh, Superfund site should it be? We don't know. I don't, it's not my area of expertise, but at the very least, we are definitely concerned a bit, particularly in that area, the dense zone. Yeah. Where there's We know there's lots of munitions that have been discharged over the last 40, 50 years. Well, is the proposed um, expansion of the dense zone, does that go, does that, would that encompass all of Breton Bay? I mean, south of, of, of Breton Bay? I mean, right now, it's like, um, you know, Cobb Island. Cult, yeah, you know, no. Uh, so the answer rock, is rock um, point, right? I mean, I could share a map with you, but uh, but basically, the, so the 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 Dogren, I'm sorry, the 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 Potomac weapons testing range is 51 miles long, right? And they mostly shoot most of the munitions, uh, basically from, you know, Cobb Island or St. Clements Island up river, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, where they want to expand. Uh, and that's called the middle danger zone, just so you know. Sure. The, I, I know the where they want the to map. expand. <laughs> where they want to expand is actually upriver and into the 301 bridge area. So it's basically they want to expand um, activities into that area, literally close to the new bridge and where this old coal fired power plant uh, exists, the uh, Morgantown site. So to me, it didn't make a lot of sense. Now, we just met with them last week. They swear that this is more for uh, unmanned drones and, and type of activities that are not linked to weapons testing necessarily, more about uh, unmanned drone flights and things like that. But to me, 
it seems a little odd that they would have this type of testing, particularly drones right next to a bridge where people are driving over and could be distracted by that activity. But yeah, it, it, you know, for an expansion, I mean, I don't know. What did you say earlier? The dead zone was 11,000 to 13,000 yards off. Down river. And they, they're talking oh. about an expansion. I thought it was three miles, right? I mean, it wasn't that. Or, uh, I don't think the expansion is that big. I don't know the actual area. Um, I just have a map that shows where basically, uh, if you look at the Dogren site, it's like a funnel down river, right? Sure. Yeah, I got you. So it made sense to me that they were shooting at least down Further. toward a bridge and a power plant. Yeah. Uh, so they swear that their expansion request is not to shoot live munitions up, up toward the bridge or anything like that, that they want to do other types of testing. Right. But again, it, it just, it, it sparked it's, the most important thing is it sparked yeah, concern. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And there's not much river there, really. I mean, from the no. weapons uh, launch site, you know, to the bridge is what, a mile and a half? I mean, it's not much, right? Uh, uh, yeah, it's pretty close. You're, you can it, see the Dogren. Yeah, from there. Site at Dogren from the bridge when you're coming over toward Virginia, for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, amazing. Now, um, I think that the, the not not so much from a litigation standpoint, but from a public relations standpoint, the idea that um, there's a press release that Steny Hoyer put out in 2018, and he was um, uh, talking about... Uh, this Norwegian firm called NAMMO, N-A-M-M-O, um, that um, has been testing ballistics um, from the base in uh, Indian Head. And I don't have this confirmed, but um, apparently um, the Norwegians didn't want to do weapons testing in their pristine fjords. So they come here to test weapons in the Potomac River. Um, so, um, I think that's an outrage. Had you ever heard that? Uh, like I said, I mean, I, I, I've been in this area for eight years now and, um, you know, just doing a lot like coal ash. I've been working on it for seven or eight years and investigating the Morgantowns. Yeah. Morgantowns right there. Yeah. So I, I'm happy. To, I know a lot about that, but what I don't know about is just some of these other sites that I know once we dig into them, it's probably going to be a multi-year process, but that's what we do. You know, for 25 years, our organization, like we, we take on these very difficult, hard issues. And if it takes 10 years to fix it, so that's it. Well, what's the, not many what's environmental the, groups want to dig into it the way we will. What's the status of Morgantown now? So, I mean, um, you know, Basically, on the Potomac River, there are uh, downriver from D.C., there's yeah, two yeah. major coal-fired power plants, Possum Point, uh, which we worked on. There's still a lot of groundwater contamination from their existing uh, coal ash ponds that are leaching into Quantico Creek. And there's uh, new data that's coming out to show contamination. It was done by uh, Martha Washington College. Uh, Dr. Frankel and his students that show, you know, heavy metal contamination, including boron, which is an indicator of coal Ooh, yeah, buddy. to Quantico Creek, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's one issue. Then downriver, right at the 301 bridge is the Morgantown coal fire plant. We've been investigating that for quite some time because we challenged the permit in 2016, and we actually were successful in eliminating uh, arsenic, mercury, selenium in their discharge permit. They're uh, MPDS permit. Yeah. Uh, but then that started prompting us to start looking at uh, other potential contamination on that site. And we started finding issues on the back end of that plant where they had, uh, you know, inappropriately uh, spread and land applied coal ash and disposed of coal ash. We believe there's a, a coal ash pond that has never been regulated under the federal CCR rules. Um, that's discharging into Pascahansa Creek, but we also know that there's an unnamed tributary that flows right through the middle of the plant, and based on a 1996 consent decree by the state of Maryland MDE, that a quarter of the discharge of the flow of that stream was from yeah. contamination. We flew drones and, and, and planes up over, and that entire stream is caked in orange, like this toxic yellow seepage 
with these oily sheens and they just flow right into Pascahansa Creek, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, like I said, we caught them in 2019 based on a tip from plant employees that they were illegally spreading ash. We got a flight up, we caught them red-handed um, and it did lead to a con another consent decree by the state of Maryland and a hundred thousand dollar fine, but we're no. still really concerned that this plant, now that it closed, it announced closure in June of 2022, that there's all this legacy contamination. And meanwhile, I've been hearing stories about bringing like casino boats and all this stuff and using that area. Um, but yet there's, we know that there's some serious legacy contamination. In fact, most coal fired power plants around the entire country all yeah. have legacy contamination under them that's leaching into our waterways. But I can only speak to the Potomac and what I know. Yeah, and That's a real concern for us, the Morgantown facility. Um, because upriver, we had the loop paper mill announced closure, uh, you know, a paper mill for operated for 130 years. The state signed off on it. And then our, our upper Potomac Riverkeeper found all this um, black liquor discharges. And then we filed notice of intent to sue and the attorney general of Maryland joined us in our case. And so, you know, we're trying to avoid that type of scenario where we uh, you know, a facility like Genon closes and shutters a plant like that and then doesn't do the proper remediation and closure. So we've been in conversations with both the permitting agencies and the enforcement and compliance section with MDE, trying to make sure that they're closing this thing properly because Genon keeps acting like, oh, this is a nothing burger. We, yeah, there's some mm -hmm. light issues, but we're cleaning all this stuff up and, and we're just saying not good enough, not, not enough. Halfway. Uh, the challenge for us, though, has been, quite frankly, we can't bring a case unless we can grab a good sample without trespassing. And we were just never able to get close enough to that facility. Those wetlands surrounding it are literally reeds 10 foot tall. And um, we just weren't able to grab a proper sample without um, trespass. So we couldn't really do it or it would jeopardize a Clean Water Act suit against them. So we're trying to um, get MDE to pay a better attention to this facility. And it's been How about really launching a kayak? Can you get up that way in high tide? That's what we were trying. We would go up in high tide specifically after a rain event, try to catch that yeah. first flush. But you it can't. was really challenging because some of the... Yeah, yeah. So every site that we investigate, I walk into it as if we're going to sue this facility someday, right? And so everything we do, we do proper documentation. We do proper chain of custody. Um, and we don't trespass because so we try to get all our samples from roadways. No, I, I agree. I, I just, just to agree. make I mean, sure. So, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, there's um, uh, I'm jealous of people like you, honestly. But I oh, just, yeah, no, there's a role. There's a role for us to play. No <laughs> question. Uh, we, we would not have been able to get some of the samples, you know, uh, or at least the highest readings of some of the samples. It's, it's a slightly different animal, though, because with PFAS, it does tend to um, dissipate, um, you know, somewhat as it travels. Um, so same know, with coal ash, because it's it's heavy metals, right? They settle out super quick. Yeah. So frustrating. I've been up where I've literally seen these large toxic orange seeps. I'm literally like 10, 15, 20 feet away. And I'm telling yeah. the E this. I'm like, listen, how can you how can you feel comfortable closing this facility and not grabbing an off-site sample where they literally have a discharge pipe, like just go and prove, you know, and then Genon was there and they're like, listen, I think you're gonna be disappointed. We've done all this sampling and we haven't found anything. I'm like, you let me come onto your site. Let uh -huh. That's different. Sample, and I promise you, I'm gonna find something. And they, they didn't agree to accept my offer. No, of course not. Um, but, <laughs> but, I, but I hear what you're saying. It's guerrilla really... tactics sometimes. But and, not and in MDE. your case, not in your case. You, you need the litigants and you need to play it straight. Um, yeah, MDE right. has the ability and the, uh, the you know, the to do that. And, it you know, so I literally pounded it. Yeah, I just met with them about a month ago. And that was my request. Like there was two sites where we believe an old like ash pond or stormwater pond to collect coal ash was illegally built. And we have satellite footage going all the way back to the 80s to show all of a sudden that was a wetland and it turned into a pond with a storm pipe that discharges right to Pascahansa Creek. And then we have that, that unnamed tributary and um, both of which discharge into Pascahansa Creek. And I was just like, listen, you know, you what? grab those sediment samples. Don't you, isn't this something you would like knowing if you're developing a closure plan, don't you think you should know 
if there's offsite contamination um, from this facility that that is right there at Pascanza Creek, which is a public waterway, will they do it? Well, yeah, they want to know. They just don't want you to know they know. <laughs> I don't think they want to know or they have oh, to do something. Oh, man, I, I, I've you know been what I mean? with the military. I, 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 I know this is, we're not talking about the military here, but I think it's the same mentality in a chain of command. I think they know the, the score. I, I really do. Um, you know, that um, they're fully aware of the chemical composition. They just don't want to share it with the public. Um, and uh, the trick is finding people within the command structure willing to talk to you off the record. I don't yeah. know if you've had any luck. Sometimes being able to I do. think they don't want to know because they, they would have to then expand the scope of cleanup. Um, so it's just better to like, if it's not, if they don't have to deal with anything offsite, right. then it's easier for the agency to then work directly with the, the responsible party. But like, once you start talking about offsite contamination in the public, it's a different animal, it, you know, it just, it, the, the scope of it gets so much bigger. Uh, that's been my experience to be honest. Sure. You know, it's probably a little bit of both, but yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, frustrating for sure. No, extremely frustrating. So what else are you um, concentrating on? Um, you know, the, the, I have the Dahlgren stuff and then, you know, the coal ash, which is extremely important. And really working with um, Susan Wind and working with people across the country during this protest, coal ash is a killer. And coal ash yeah. is poisoning little nine-year-old girls, three or four of them with various types of eye cancer living in you know, South North Carolina suburbs, uh, you know, due to Duke energy and nothing is happening, nothing is changing. Um, incredibly frustrating. I get that. So you got the coal ash and then you got Dahlgren. Are th those are your two primary sources of focus right now? Well, we have several lawsuits. Like I mentioned, Alexandria, we're suing uh, Metcom downriver in St. Mary's County for sewage pollution. They got okay. Okay, hold up. Do you know um, uh, Erickson, uh, the um, director of Metcom? I'm, I'm sure he's a defendant in your suit, huh? Yeah, I, I don't I can't they, remember his first they, name. I went and spoke and they, they called the police on me and threatened me arrest. So we've sued them since. Now the Attorney General of Maryland joined our case. So they've kind of shut up and, um, you know, they're fixing the problem, thank God. So we deal with a lot of, uh, you know, broken uh sewage issues you know yeah like, are you talking about the marley taylor um wastewater treatment facility is that which one Met well it, the treatment facility discharges into the bay which is out of our jurisdiction but they've had a lot of issues with their collection system they've had over uh almost 40 um sso you know sanitary sewer overflows which have led to a lot of sewage getting into the oysters that water uh, St. George's oh. Creek. I'm looking at St. George's Creek right through yeah. the window there. I'm on yeah. the St. Mary's River. There's St. George's Island. It's in the terrace. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. No, I was all about and, that. Uh, so we're actually, what's great about this is uh, we were joined by Shore Things Seafood. Waterman joined us in our litigation against Metcom, which was really great because it took, got the attention of the uh, Maryland Attorney General who then intervened um, in this case, basically. And, and Ryan Frosch, right? That was a good thing. I feel like we're going to get a very positive outcome. Yeah. But So we deal with a lot of sewage issues up at all over the watershed, too. But now you're having a, a, a change in the attorney generalship in the state of Maryland, right? It's not Brian well, Frosch. I thought anymore. Brian Frosch was pretty good, but. Oh, absolutely. I, he, he was in the same neighborhood with me in Bethesda, so we got to know yeah. him pretty well. Uh, excellent but, man, and I've had a, a bit to do with him, you know, over the years. But he's gone now. Yeah, he's gone. I don't know the new attorney general. Uh, but... What's her name? Brooke Lieberman. Okay. A little bit of, more of a moderate, but still, compared to most states, you can work with her. Hey, as long as they're enforced, that was the big problem under Hogan. A enforcement dropped by 85%, according to a report by Center for Progressive Reform. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I noticed it, you know, it just started getting worse and worse. Yeah, yeah. My time here. And um, so, I, you know, I don't know if you saw there was legislation passed that one of my coworkers worked on um, mm -hmm. 
see Nicholas, who was the executive director of Waterkeepers Chesapeake, they ended up, they're getting like, I think 50, 60 new positions with Maryland uh, MDE to do, to get back into doing real enforcement. <laughs> so I was really right. encouraged by that because I think it's really critical. It shouldn't have to fall on the attorney general, quite frankly. Um, MDE should be doing their jobs with enforcement. Absolutely. Well, you know, we saw um, Hogan and his MDE chief, Ben Grumbles, uh, you know, were a, a dynamic duo for eight years and they drove <laughs> the state into the into the ground. Uh, and, you know, Ben Grumbles, um, his resume is aw awful, awful. I mean, he is the, the doer of the devil's deeds. And um, he, oh. he, he managed to parlay this excellent resume of his into being the executive director of ECOS. Are, are you aware of ECOS? E-C-O-S? Um, I'm not. And it's, it's the Environmental Council of the States. Oh, yes. Oh, boy. Are you yeah. kidding me? And so it's, it's one of the principal lobbies in Congress to oh, undo no. the CWA. No way. Really? Way. Or, wow, or ju just to you know, deregulate as much as you can. And so, you know, you look at the uh, Hogan Grumbles record and you see why this guy, you know, Grumbles got hired by Ecos. Yeah. And he I loved mean, pollution trading, which I'm absolutely opposed to. No, you, it's the devil's bargain, man. Yeah. And I, I get it. Um, no, these are, these are sick men. I no. was very happy to hear that Hogan dropped out of his you know, presidential bid, if if he was even in it, but a um, little off track. They're all think, afraid of know, Trump. <laughs> Jesus, I know. Another um, story. Yeah, another story, man. Um, but, you know, getting back to like the, the golden rule and, you know, their, um, their mission um, is, you know, radiology, radi radiological contamination. And so, I wrote um, a story um, that detailed um, um, radiological contamination at Indian Head, Dahlgren, uh, Chesapeake Beach, the Naval Research Laboratories, Chesapeake Bay Detachment, and the Naval um, Academy in Annapolis. And all four, you know, went through the um, radiological assessment program, and they've all had reports done, three, 400 page reports on exactly what is where in terms of radiologically contaminated items on each place. Dahlgren sticks out, man. <laughs> Do you know anything of their radiological past? Zero. Oh, God, it's amazing. I'll send you some stuff, uh, you know. On, well, like on. I said, I just found out it was a super fun site maybe about five weeks ago. So, you know, it's it's yeah, a, yeah. for us, the Dahlgren. Um, yeah, they... Um, they used, um, you know, weaponry and tested uh, um, uh, depleted uranium and, and built these giant concrete walls and just crashed into them. And actually, during the early '50s, were instrumental in developing the second phase of the uh, of of the little boy or fat boy or whatever the hell it was atomic bomb that was dropped over Hiroshima. So Dahlgren has a lengthy history of nuclear contamination not so much so at indian head but but again you know that really doesn't doesn't really factor into clean water act enforcement today i don't guess not at all, all right. yeah that's the challenge it is a challenge. possibly factor into resource conservation recovery act but again you know our jurisdiction begins at end of the water so um if it's if it's a you know issue on land and there's no yeah. that's entering the river there's not yeah. much about it yeah 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 it's a darn shame um now uh where does the jurisdiction um between the upper potomac river keeper and 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 the potomac river keeper i mean is it great falls you know where where is the line of demarcation between the two um, Harper's Ferry. So my jurisdiction begins at Harper's Ferry and goes all the way to the bay. Damn. Riverkeeper goes to the headwaters, and then our Shenandoah Riverkeeper starts at Harper's Ferry and goes to the headwaters of the Shenandoah. So that's where all our jurisdictions either begin or end. So there are several military 
sites further north of Washington. There's a ballistics manufacturing plant up there too on the uh, Virginia side, I guess. Um, uh, and then of course there's- um, You mean uh, up in West Virginia, above Harvard? Yeah, West Virginia, yeah. What's the name okay, of that place? Okay, gotcha. Oh, that's yeah, above. I, that's above, that's yeah. right. And, yeah. Well, there's uh, um, the Monocacy River draining uh, Fort Dietrich. I don't, you know, that's that's a biological animal. Oh, God. You know what? It, <laughs> we, we so there was there was a guy who was an expert on that. He was like worked on Circla, you know, the military Circla, and we had a meeting set up with him, my legal director and I, to talk yeah. about all the legacy contamination that was leaking from Fort Detrick, right? Yeah. So we were scheduled to have this meeting, and then all of a sudden he died. Like we lost all that institutional knowledge. And he never, we never had the meeting. And it was just tragic, honestly. Like uh, we were starting to, but I don't have anybody else who's super knowledgeable. I, you know, with all these sites, as you know, right, you need help um, to dig in the research and stuff. Like we do the on the ground investigations and the sampling, but we still need lawyers to help uh, pursue the case. We need technical experts and we need researchers who can help us dig into some of the documentation and some of the old information that I just don't have time to do because of what I do being out. Well, on the if you'd like, I can forward you some information on Dahlgren and the context of uh, yeah. a couple yes. of folks. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Um, long story short, you know, I was um, lumped in with, uh, there were a total of 53 of us that were in a uh, uh, database kept by the Maryland State Police uh, on, you know, they, it was a terrorist watch list. So they categorized me as a terrorist. And there were, it, it's interesting, um, two folks from uh, both PhDs, I believe, or maybe one, the guy was a lawyer, his wife is a PhD, um, who worked um, over the years with, um, you know, uh, uh, Dietrich, and uh, they were, you know, put into a terrorist watch list database. Um, I forget the guy's name right now. It's been a little bit of time, but I'm sure uh, I can hook you up with those guys. Um, and I, I know that um, there have been three publications by the DOD that mentioned D Dietrich in terms of PFAS remediation, but never get into, you know, what they might have used there. So, uh, and the yeah. thing is, is just, um, uh try to think about what I was talking about. Like if there's legacy contamination, like nuclear waste on the land, we can't yeah. really yeah, much yeah. about it. But if, if you think like, for instance, Indian head, they're discharging munitions to the river, right? We, yeah. we know that they should have a clean water act permit. Cause as soon as I saw you speak, yeah. I was like, we need to start digging into Indian head once we're done with Dogren. And yeah. so that those are the things that we can go after is like, is there ongoing, Occurring or something that we can sample and prove that there's offsite contamination, the agencies aren't doing much about it, then that gives us total freedom to go after those polluters. So um, keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about ways uh, you can help us with information, whether it's Fort Detrick or uh, Indian Head or wh whatever, or honestly, right upstream here from where I live, um, you know, the Air Force Base, Andrews Air Force Base. Those are all things of interest, but thinking about how we can actually go after that. And, oh, something real interest to you, Pat. Yeah. Georgetown Litigation Clinic. Okay. Just amazing report for us that is not public yet. And it was all the legal hooks in which groups like ours could go after facilities for PFAS and or put pressure on EPA. So there's like petitioning, you know, stuff, but they really looked at, here's the ways that you can go after PFAS legitimately through Clean Water Act, Resource Conservation Recovery Act. So wow. trying to get them comfortable with sharing this to all the water keepers, because we have a lot of water keepers around the country that are dealing with PFAS or starting to learn about PFAS. But for me, it's been very nebulous. Like, okay, we know that this is linked to firefighting foam and we know about Teflon, but how do we actually go after this? Right? Well, I know how to do it. I think yeah. I, I have a so, darn good idea. Um, well, you just picked up on the narrative that they want you to pick up which is the firefighting foam. And you know, if the DOD and the EPA have a playbook, it is to isolate 
all thinking about PFAS to you know two categories. It's, it's, it's it, it derived from the firefighting foam, and it's all about contaminated drinking water. When really the number one source of um, uh, number one pathway to human ingestion for PFAS is um, you know from uh, fish uh, food food first fish you know. Uh, it, from contaminated waters is the number one way people get sick. So, I mean, you can have one forkful of filet from, you know, Brent's, uh, you know, uh, smallmouth bass up in, you know, uh, where was it, uh, Antietam Creek. Yeah. And that would probably give you more PFAS than drinking water with 70 parts per trillion for until for 80 years. I mean, it's that much more concentrated. So when you take a facility like um, Indian Head, PFAS is used as an engine degreaser on military bases. It is used to clean engine parts. And so if you have a huge base like, you know, the home of Air Force One, you know, uh, Andrews, um, it's a routine thing that you take a, a the engine uh, blocks of these giant fighters um, and you take them apart and you clean them. And um, and what they they do is they... they um, they clean them with um, PFAS, and at the end of the day, the PFAS goes down the drain and either goes into surface waters, groundwater, or wastewater treatment plants, one of the three, but in any of the three cases, it's not treated. They also use this stuff in chrome plating, um, and this may be the, the number one uh, way. And with chrome plating, you take an, a, 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 you know, a, an engine part that's made of <coughs> steel, or even aluminum, I understand. And you actually put it into a bath that looks a lot like a hot tub. And the bath um, is made up of, of chromium hexavalent, which is um, you know, a um, highly carcinogenic uh, uh, material. Um, and um, it has an aerosol that comes up that is deadly when you breathe it. And so they pour PFAS into these baths for chrome plating, and the PFAS acts like a blanket and 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 um, eliminates the aerosol from coming into the air. It's the same principle as you know using PFAS in firefighting foams. Um, um, so you know when you spray this shaving cream, it just snuffs out the air, and there's a blanket there, and it puts the fire out. The thing is, the the military has now stopped using the. Um, you know, firefighting foams in routine practices. They still have them in cases of emergency, but they're pumping out unbelievable amounts of PFAS into the environment. So um, I was able to capture, um, you know, from a screenshot from a PowerPoint presentation given by the Navy at the Naval Research Labs Chesapeake Bay Detachment. Um, and it showed the stream, right? coming from the old, uh, you know, firefighting foam uh, testing area, okay? And so you travel down the stream, which, you know, the, the chart is probably about three quarters of a mile. And then up near the firefighting area, it had, you know, parts per trillion in the thousands. And by the time it traveled almost a mile, it had dropped down to 125 parts per trillion. As soon as it passed by the outflow of the wastewater treatment plant, it increased eightfold before it was dumped into the Chesapeake Bay. So you can just tell from this one graphic, it's all about the outflows from wastewater treatment plants. There's no, there's no, um, you know, uh, uh, the firefighting uh, exercises have ended. So what we're seeing is um, the contamination, say at Andrews is all about, you know, what's being um, discharged um, through the wastewater treatment plant and and directly into the water from you know sources other than the the firefighting foam and that's important because it can be documented and so I spent some time this year trying to um, uh, work with others to pass a bill in Maryland that would have regulated or not even regulated but calling for the universal testing of wastewater treatment plant effluent for PFAS. And then, of course, the PFAS goes into the sludge as well. And the sludge is, you know, spread on agricultural, you know, fields. Um, this is an important part of all of it. So when you're talking about Clean Water Act and you're talking about ongoing, this is pretty well documented. 
and easy to be able to document. I just um, teamed up with a woman with Kaiser Family Foundation, KFF, and they also have the KFF Newsroom. And um, they are a force to be reckoned with down the road. They're just getting into the PFAS. And um, I mean, they're, they're insurers, for God's sakes. So what, what a marriage of, 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 that makes sense. You know, activists looking at PFAS and the people that have to pay for the, you know, health of people that's being wrecked by these chemicals. So they came out and filmed me when I took a, a, a sample at Piscataway Creek. We got our results and it had over 2000 parts per trillion of PFOS in the drinking water two weeks ago at Andrews, Piscataway Creek. It's significant um, because state of Minnesota has regulations in some lakes that limit PFOS to um, 0.05 parts per trillion, 0.05. We got, you know, I think that, that test was 895 parts per trillion of PFOS, many, many, many times over. Total P PFAS over 2000. Um, but the point is that um, Minnesota is saying, we need to keep this stuff down under one or two parts per trillion in our lakes because the bioaccumulation factors in fish might be three to 5,000 times for some species. So if you have one part per trillion of PFOS in surface water and you got a little goldfish or a little sunflower fish, some little fish that big that eats, you know, that, that has, well, we tested it in Piscataway Creek, 375 freaking thousand parts per trillion in the fillet of a sunfish, okay, which are eaten by the largemouth bass. So you had 94,000 parts per trillion in the largemouth bass at the, at the, at the mouth of the creek, you know, where it's tidal, uh, you know, in Akakik, near you, that by your house, you know. Right and, near my um, house. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so that is significant because it's ongoing and we can demonstrate that. No, I don't know. The another well, thing is at. Um, I want to go up to Andrews and walk where you've uh, captured that discharge. Oh, hey, I can show you how to do it. Um, oh, I'm serious. I want to do that. So yeah, yeah. Send yeah. me an email because I do have to run here in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think it was the only other point I was going to make is that Indian Head, um, we did a uh, Maryland public information request, uh, and uh, I got data for one quarter on the PFAS discharges, and it was close to 200 parts per trillion uh, being pumped into the Potomac. That's ongoing. It From is. their actual permitted discharge points. Correct. Well, right there, that's a Clean Water Act hook. Let's talk. You know, I don't know, I don't know that angle of it, but I'll send you what I got. Oh, we do. We do. Well, I know. Well, that's why it's great that, uh, you know, these folks at the Golden Rule put us together, you know? Yeah, for sure. Like, appreciate it. Um, so Ed is back. Ed, I think we're good to go, right? Yeah, it looks like I've got a lot of work to do. Okay, good. <laughs> but uh, actually, you know, so that, that's a great conversation. Appreciate Thanks a lot.